And, uh, but over the past eight months, I think what, what we've learned is that the gigantic apparatus, the spying apparatus that the NSA has built that's supposed to be pointed outward has in fact been pointed inward. Um, has been pointed inward and has been um, intentionally collecting vast amounts of information about innocent Americans who have done no wrong. So if you go to work at NSA, they actually, they say they take privacy very seriously and they, um, and they have you know, these intensive training programs and they have internal lawyers. They have so many lawyers at the NSA. Uh, and I mean, it is a system of rules. There are different rules than you or I sh might think they should follow, but they have, they have rules for everything. And, and people at NSA are taught that they don't spy on Americans. And I think many people there believe that. But it, the problem is it's, we do not spy on Americans, star, and then in small print, hello, <laughs> Um, in the same way that you buy a toy at Toys R Us, and it's, you know, batteries may, uh, batteries not included, some assemble, you know, you may be required to assemble this at home. Um, and the NSA truly believes that they are focused on the collection of foreign intelligence information. They believe that in their hearts. This is how the, the staff at NSA go to work every morning. This is how they feel like they are contributing to the safety of this country. And uh, I am confident that NSA has done lots of really good things to keep this country safe. Um, but the problem is that in their path to protect this country, um, the line between what is domestic and foreign initially got blurred. And then people are allowed to sort of step over it just a little bit, but with good intentions. And you know, if they covered their eyes and then were looking on the other side of the line, then it was okay. And until finally, the kinds of collection that we've learned is taking place um, started to take place. And, and so, the NSA is no longer a agency focused on foreign surveillance. Uh, one of the programs that is most widely known now uh, is what's called the Domestic Telephony Metadata Program. Um, basically, the NSA is collecting records of every telephone call made in this country. Um, this is truly a domestic program. This is not a collection of calls made by someone in Yemen to someone in Iraq. These are calls made by someone in Baltimore calling someone in Washington. Um, and the reason that they were able to perform this, to, to engage in this kind of program, while still keeping true to their mission, is that in the, uh, in the, in the view of the NSA, it's not collection if you don't look at it. So they believe that it's, it's okay for them to collect every record, as long as it's just sitting in a computer data center somewhere, and it's only computer programs that are looking through it and scanning it, not human beings. Um, they have different interpretation, they have different meanings for words that, the, that many of us use, things like search, things like scan or collect, right? In, NSA, in the NSA world, in the NSA dictionary, collection only is triggered when a human being looks at it. Um, and so that's allowed them some freedom to do things that the rest of us might think would be domestic surveillance. We've learned that they have this database of call records, which means that there's a database, there's, a, there's an entry somewhere at Fort Meade revealing every single person who called an abortion clinic, every single person who called a suicide hotline, or a gun shop, or a gay bookstore. Um, and the assurance they give us is, well, don't worry, we're not looking for that. We are only looking for information about people who are doing really bad things. Um, but then you probe them a little bit, and you say, well, how are you looking for those bad people? And they say, well, we have these algorithms. We have these algorithms that we can use to search for information. Um, and the algorithms that they have uh, involve <coughs> searching through multiple hops. And, and what that means is, if a particular person that they think is a bad guy is in this database, they will look for every person that has called that person. And then every person that has called those people. And then every person that has called those other people. And so they go layer by layer by layer. You, would ima you could imagine, for example, if a would-be terrorist calls Pizza Hut to so place an order for pizza, every other person who's called that Pizza Hut has now been caught in that net. Every person who's called someone who's called that pizza hut is now in their net. Um, and again, NSA is focused on catching what they believe are the bad guys, but their methods are invasive, they are overbroad, and they are pointed at the United States. We've also learned that NSA is collecting vast amounts of information about domestic internet traffic. Uh, for several years, they were collecting metadata, so similar to the telephone records, they were collecting records of emails, so they were collecting records of who was emailing whom, um, which web pages people might be viewing. Uh, and that took place for several years. 
Uh, we've also learned that uh, NSA, with their partners at GCHQ, which is the British intelligence agency, have been engaging even in even more collection of information. So GCHQ um, has been compiling a database of every single time anyone in the world clicks the like button on a web page. Um, every single time someone visits a, a video on YouTube and watches that video, GCHQ is collecting that data to provide live information to um, politicians. They want to know which videos are becoming hot in Turkey um, before uh, anyone else knows. Maybe there's you know, a video that is going to lead to riots. They want to know that, and the way they get it is by scanning the web, by monitoring all these people's uh, uh, connections. The most interesting revelation that came out just in the last month or two um, was the news that uh, GCHQ has been creating screenshots every minute or two of people's Yahoo webcam chats. So people are using Yahoo Messenger to communicate, like Skype, uh, video webcam conversations. A significant number of these apparently are intimate. Um, and Yahoo, uh, GCHQ didn't have the, the storage capability to save raw video, but they just saved screenshots every, you know, every minute or two. Uh, and then captured a vast amount of sensitive information. Now the reason they did this, and the reason they grabbed the Facebook likes, and the YouTube views, uh, and the telephone records, is because the general approach within this intelligence community is to collect it all. Right? They're, in their view, what they should be doing is getting everything they possibly can, uh, and then figuring out what they can do with it later. What kind of useful intelligence they can gain from that. Um, and so really what we've learned over the past eight months is that we have an intelligence agency that is out of control. This is an agency that is collecting information about law-abiding Americans who have done nothing wrong. Um, and the only assurance they can give us is, well, don't worry, we're not looking at the information we're collecting. Um, and I think there are many Americans who are, who are troubled um, by those kinds of assurances because they, they frankly ring um, very hollow. technical point you, you asked is why do we let Google and these private companies collect data on us? The one thing that not everybody understands is Google does not just sell us ads. I mean, anybody can sell ads. What Google does is it builds something called a Google user model on every single person in America. Who knows what that is? I have no idea what's in there, but it's a blob of data about every single person. And we don't know what happens to that data. We, Google doesn't seem like they're very friendly with the NSA. They're probably not selling that information right now. But we do know that the NSA has been inside of Google's data centers collecting data. We don't know how much of those that, that model information they collected. We don't know what's in there. We don't know what it tells you. But it's a lot of really intelligent algorithms distilling the essence of what you like and what you searched on into a blob of data. Who knows what that means? Particularly by the same secrecy that protected the FBI, the CIA, and the Pentagon for the 30 years between 1950s and 1976. Which is all to say that government spying in secret, abusing the rights of the American people. These are well-established traditions in our nation's history. This is what our intelligence agencies do as a matter of historical fact. So let's uh, step into the current time slice. I want to suggest to you that there are values beyond privacy to worry about. And you could think about the NSA conducting mass surveillance in secret as an abuse of democratic transparency. You'd be right. You could think of it as an abuse of the independent checks and balances that the founders of our country built into the Constitution to try to constrain executive power from becoming potentially tyrannical. You'd be right about that. You could describe it as an example of institutional corruption, which I'll zoom in on a bit, and you'd be right about that. Uh, and you could describe it as a, an abuse of the public trust, privacy, sure. I want you to think of its relationship to freedom of thought. When the government knows everything that you have said or read or heard or written, every meeting that you've gone to, every website that you've visited, how likely, and let's just make this real, how likely are you to embrace an unpopular opinion when you know that there's an agency down the street watching you? <coughs> or to do anything about it, like possibly raise your voice as you're constitutionally entitled to do under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, right? The threat to privacy is much more vast than merely, for instance, being seen naked by the government. Like that's, that is an immaterial privacy interest. That's the kind of privacy interest that is private. I'm interested in the kind of privacy interest that is public. The aggregate import of privacy for individuals is the possibility of democracy for a society. Without privacy for individuals, without thought privacy, you cannot have a meaningful democracy, full stop, period. 
and when members of Congress and other elected officials swear an oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the principal enemy of the U.S. Constitution is a three-letter agency housed house down the street controlling your curriculum. So let's just zoom in past the freedom of thought piece. I'm going to try to go quickly through this last bit. So uh, I do want to describe the NSA's issues here as part of a broader constellation of government surveillance programs beyond the NSA that to this point have generally evaded the public scrutiny, the ongoing congressional reform debate, and the mass controversy that this event is you know, thankfully a part of. Uh, the FBI's problems with respect to domestic surveillance continue unimpeded. You can see it particularly in the Occupy movement when there was established a document trail of a coordinated FBI campaign to shut the movement down through force using local police departments. That represented not just the loss of the freedom of thought, but the freedom of assembly as well. There are, just last Thursday, there were coordinated actions in seven different cities around the country calling attention to local police surveillance coordinated through DHS funded, uh, Department of Homeland Security funded fusion centers. And Chris actually just drew my attention on the way here to a piece of news today out of New York City that NYPD had grown renowned. In fact, the Associated Press got a Pulitzer Prize for exposing to the public the NYPD's surveillance operations targeting particularly Muslim New Yorkers and anyone who happened to be near them. So if you went to a school anywhere in the Northeast and there was a Muslim student in your class, it would not be unlikely that there was an NYPD agent in the class monitoring at least what that student said, and by extension, anything you might say as well. And the infiltration of university campuses, I mean, I'm, I'm citing this example for a reason, right? Like The infiltration of your spaces that are meant to be free opportunities for exchange and discourse by the intelligence agencies is much more severe than merely an abuse of your privacy, right? That is a collective harm that has dramatic implications for our society. Um, and then just to finish here, I'd say that you in Maryland have particular opportunities to influence the national debate. Not only is the NSA uh, have a particular relationship with your university, which is uh, very much you know, a focus for today's remarks. I do want to share with you a bill that is currently in play in the Maryland State Legislature that would, among other things, require the public university system, so not Hopkins, but particularly UMD, to refuse NSA support that would allow the agency to determine student curriculum. It would require state prosecutors to decline evidence submitted to them for criminal prosecution through an NSA channel, and that has happened in drug prosecutions with the DEA. It would also, this is where it gets good, require the state and public utilities that do business with the state to shut off water and electricity to government facilities engaged in mass surveillance. <laughs> right? I mean, this is an opportunity for you in Maryland to take a swipe at the jugular. And here's the thing, there's only one other state in the country that can do it, and there's a bill there too in Utah. And you can see in Maryland and Utah very divergent political sensibilities. It's striking to me that we found support in both of those states, as has the congressional reform track across all parts of the country and all parts of the political continuum. You as Americans share a vital interest beyond your ideology, beyond whatever else you care about. Just by virtue of the fact that you have, I hope, some attachment to being free, there are others like you from very diverse viewpoints and backgrounds around the country, and you in Maryland have particular influence uh, because you vote in a state uh, and you live in a state that has one of the principal spy centers in it. And through state legislation, you have an opportunity to defang the beast even while we wait for Congress to get off its hands and while we wait for the courts to finally do anything to demonstrate their independence and while we finally wait for the president to wake up and remember his pledge as a candidate.